Good evening, everybody. We've got a few folks in the back who were waiting to seat, but we're ready to go. It's a great day for our library, great day for the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival. Welcome to the Rancho Mirage Public Library and welcome to the second author talk in our new series, the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival Writers Series. My name is David Bryant. I have the good fortune to be both the library director and the executive director of the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is not my Elvis imitation. We have some of our city council with us. This council that supports its library better than any library in California. And since the early days of the Writers' Festival, they gave it their full support. Mayor Charles Townsend could not be with us tonight. And Mayor uh, Pro Tem Richard Kite is not with us tonight either. They're at meetings and they're helping the city off-site. We have with us tonight council members Dana Hobart, Iris Smotrich, and Ted Weil. Thank you, city council. We also have with us somebody whom some of you may know. His name is Jamie Kabler. <laughs> Jamie Kabler is our Writers' Festival founder and the man who brings unlimited energy to the festival and its mission, uniting readers and writers. Jamie Kabler. We also have Senator Barbara Boxer with us tonight. Senator Boxer. And a little detail, there's a microphone centered in this room, and I've spoken to Don, and he is more than happy to do Q&A after this. Thank you so much. Don is also going to stay on to uh, sign books in the rear of the room. So we're so pleased to have him with us. Now, here is the abridged Don Winslow introduction. James Elroy says of Don Winslow, he's the master of the dope war novel. Don is a New York Times bestselling author of 20 novels, including The Force, The Kings of Cool, Savages, The Winter of Frankie Machine, and highly acclaimed epics, The Power of the Dog and the Cartel. He is the son of a sailor and a librarian. I think that's fantastic. I mean, we need sailors and we need librarians. And Don is living proof of what a wonderful marriage that must have been. He grew up in Rhode Island, attended the University of Nebraska, earning a degree in African studies. And a geography lesson follows. Don Winslow moved to New York City to become a writer. He worked as a movie theater manager and later a private investigator in Times Square. He then earned a master's degree in military history intending to go into the foreign service, but instead joined a friend's photographic safari company in Africa, Kenya. He led trips there as well as hiking expeditions in southwestern China. He later directed Shakespearean productions during summers in Oxford, England. What we should have on this screen is the globe. And with each of these locations, we should have an arrow that says, Don Winslow slept here. <laughs> it wasn't that funny, Jamie. It really wasn't. His first novel, A Cool Breeze on the Underground, was nominated for an Edgar Award with a wife and a young son. And his wife, Jean, is with us tonight. Welcome, Jean. Don went back to investigative work, mostly in California, where he and his family lived in hotels for three years as he worked cases and became a trial consultant. He settled in California after his book, The Death and Life of Bobby Z, was published and sold as a film. Along with his friend Shane Salerno, Don wrote a television series, You See Undercover, and the two collaborated on the screenplay of his novel, Savages. Don Winslow's novels have attracted the attention of filmmakers and actors, Oliver Stone, Michael Mann, Martin Scorsese, Ridley Scott, Robert De Niro, and Leonardo DiCaprio. I've never heard of any of them. <laughs> 20th Century Fox has optioned his novel about an NYPD cop, as well as the cartel and the power of the dog. In addition to his novels, he has published numerous short stories in anthologies and magazines, such as Esquire, the LA Times Magazine, and Playboy. His columns have appeared in the Huffington Post, CNN Online, and other outlets. Don is the recipient of the Raymond Chandler Award, the LA Times Book Prize, the Ian Fleming Silver Dagger, 
the RBA Literary Prize, and many other awards. Please join me in giving a big Rancho Mirage welcome to Don Winslow. Thank you. That's very kind. Great Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's nice to be here. Thank you all for coming out. I'm very flattered. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I know I'm supposed to talk about the book. I don't want to. <laughs> There are no publishers reps here, so what are they gonna do to me? And you'll keep the secret, right? Good. I, what I'd really like to talk about for a couple of minutes, and then I'd like to Q and A, because I'd, I'd rather have a conversation here tonight than me just yapping at you, but I'd like to talk about libraries for a minute. Is that okay with y'all? Yeah. I, I wanna talk about two libraries in particular. Uh, stated that my mother was a librarian and my dad was a sailor. I've often said that my, my dad was a sailor who loved books and my mom was a librarian who loved a sailor. <laughs> and I grew up in a little uh, fishing village in uh, southern Rhode Island. That sounds silly because Rhode Island's about the size of your parking lot, but I grew up in the, the southern part of it. Uh, and uh, my mom was a librarian at the Robert Beverly Hale Library which was smaller than this room, considerably built in the 1800s, made of good New England granite, sat on a ridge overlooking the ocean in a blue collar fishing village, really. And it wasn't uh, kind of a shh kind of library. The head librarian used to tie her Alaskan Malamute to the library cart and let the kids ride it around and put books back on the shelf. And there was a cat that slept on the checkout counter that really was in charge of the place. And uh, that library to me though, when I was 10, 11, 12, that age, was the world. That was the world. I, I was a kid who was expected to go work in the fish factory or be a fisherman. And that would have been all right. But when I went to that library, I could go anywhere. I could go anywhere. I could go to Africa. I could go to China. I could go to Europe. Even better than that, I could time travel. Yeah? I could go to the past. I was hooked on histories. I, I never read fiction as a child. I just read biographies. I was a little weird. I was reading biographies of Patrick Henry and Thomas Jefferson and Davy Crockett. And then, then I moved on to the, these books. Maybe some of you remember them called You Were There. Remember that they were published by Landmark. And there was always two kids, a boy and a girl, and they were there, you know, at whatever. The Battle of Gettysburg, the Johnstown Flood, wherever it was, they were there. You, you remember these books. What it gave me was a sense of possibilities. Yeah? That whatever I wanted to learn about, whatever I wanted to know about, present, past, future, in America, overseas, that little library, considerably smaller than this room, gave that to me. And I first began to conceive the idea of becoming a writer. Uh, you're quite right, my parents' marriage was, you know, interesting. And they, uh, they always let us read whatever we wanted to read at any age. So if I was eight and I wanted to read Guadalcanal Diary, it was okay with them. My dad turned me on to James Mishner you know, and Leon Uris, a guy named Robert Rourke, who wrote a book about safari guides. And I'm 12 years old reading about safari guides, you know, the book I took out of the library, and uh, thinking, one day, I want to be that guy. I want to do that. You know, possibilities. So I thought about becoming a writer, and uh, it took the world a long time to agree with that ambition. <laughs> They didn't agree. But I want to flash forward a number of decades to the second library I'd like to talk about tonight. Uh, we moved to California eventually, as my biographer here said, and moved up to, I'm not supposed to say this anymore, but it's been said, we moved up to Julian, California, up the road here, where we still live, bought a little ranch. Been there now 20 years. And uh, the town needed a library tiny town, you know, the, the school district, the high school district is 625 square miles. 
uh, with 150 kids in the school, and scattered, and we had a really a glorified closet in, in part of a town museum that was functioning as the library, or not functioning really as a library. We needed a library. We needed a library for the high school kids. We needed a library for the people in our town. And so we started, you know, and we raised money and we got grants and we went to the state and we went to the county. We did bake sales, we did readings, we did that kind of old fashioned democratic thing, you know. We went out to the ranchers who lived scattered around the hills and said, you know, we need you to write us a check. We need a library, we need a library. And we got the money, we raised it. And they started construction. And then it was a night in October that I will never forget. And the fires came. And, uh, and the fires didn't stop. And we lost a third of the homes in our town 2,200 homes, 22 lives, um, 77,000 acres. And it was dark. These are dark times. Gene remembers them well. And uh, we fled down here, actually. We were all evacuated. Some folks went to Borrego. We came to this area, to Palm Desert. And uh, we were told our house had burned down. It turned out it hadn't. Uh, it was my birthday, I got a phone call from someone who was standing in my house, but then five minutes later got another phone call from a neighbor whose house had burned down. It was that kind of thing. And we, we, when we were allowed to get back into town, uh, fortunately the rains had come, which helped put the fire out, but it got very cold. And we went in, if you've ever been to Julian, it's you know, basically one, two streets, wooden sidewalks in an old town hall. And, we didn't know what we were doing. None of us were emergency managers, uh, but we started a, a relief center in the town hall. And uh, a bunch of us, Gene and myself, my kid, a number of people were there for a number of months. One of our jobs was to get water. And I'll never forget one of the darkest nights of my life. Uh, the first night we were back there, the temperatures dropped down to freezing. We were still in the condition where people were wandering around in shock with the soles of their shoes burned out. And people were cold, people were cold. And we had no power, and we collected a bunch of cell phones and we were trying to use them until the batteries ran out. And I was on cell phones calling, as we quaintly say, down the hill, by which we mean San Diego, trying to see if anyone could bring us coats, blankets and everyone had given to the Red Cross. The Red Cross hadn't made it up there yet. And it was this horrible feeling of failure and desperation, and you saw people in real need, and you couldn't do anything about it, you know? And then the phone rang, and it was a woman, and she said to me, she said, uh, yes, I would like to see some devastation. <laughs> and by this time, I'm tired and irritable, and scared, really. And I said, because I, I tend to mouth off to people, let's face it. And I said, well, lady, come on up, because that's the only thing we got plenty of. I forgot about it. Two hours later, a bunch of vans pull up outside of town hall, three or four vans. And all these women in uniform, Chinese women, get out of the van. And they've got blue vests, so they all look alike, and they're all dressed alike. And uh, this one woman comes up to me, and I, I don't know if you've had this experience in your life, you probably have, where you look someone in the eyes and you know that, you know, the nonsense hour is over. <laughs> right? And she comes up to me, so are you Don Winslow? I said, yeah. And she put her hand on my shoulder, looked me in the eyes and said, honey, it's going to be all right. And in these vans were all coats and blankets. I'm going to talk about the library, though. We got through it. We got through it. We were at the Relief Center for, what, maybe three months, or four months, or something like that. It's funny, I wrote a book called The Power of the Dog about Mexican drug cartels, and critics have often referred to the scorched moral landscape of that book. It makes me laugh because I finished that book sitting on you know, pallets of water in the Relief Center with my little Mac laptop looking at nothing but a charred landscape. And I often wonder if it had that effect. But the following spring, 
the building of the library resumed. And let me tell you, the day that library opened was so important to the people of our town and our community because it meant so much more. Do you know what I mean? It was just this symbol that we were still here, that we were alive, that there was regeneration. And so now that library is the gathering place in our town and the kids go there to study and we go there for programs like this and other things. So I often think, you know, when I'm asked to come speak at libraries and thank you very much, of these two libraries that sort of have bracketed my career and my life, you know? One, when you're a child, that gives you this sense of possibility and launches you on your life and on your career. And on the other side, this symbol of regeneration and rebirth and hope and youth that, that the Julian Library means to me. So that's my little homily on libraries and I just wanted to share that with you because um, <laughs> these places are important. These places are important and for all of you who have helped to build this beautiful facility, uh, you know, you need to know that. You probably already do. Uh, I, I guess I should talk a little bit about the book. Uh, the book's called The Force. It was up there a minute ago. Uh, black and red kind of book. There it is, thank you. You guys are on the job, man. You guys are great. Uh, it, it's a little embarrassing what's said on there. But uh, I was born in New York City, Staten Island. We were talking about that and uh, lived and worked there off and on for years. Yes, I was a PI in Times Square before Mickey Mouse got there. This was when it was still crack vials and you know, ladies of a professional aspect and drug dealers and all kinds of, of stuff. It's been considerably cleaned up since then. I lived on the Upper West Side in Harlem when it was small arms fire. Uh, when the shooting would start, I would get in the bathtub dry bathtub and read, because it's hard for a bullet to go through the bathtub. That was you know, our protection. Uh, but I loved it. I had a good time. I enjoyed New York. And I have always wanted to write a New York cop novel. This is a novel about a lot of things. Uh, its, its principal plot is uh, uh, cops that go wrong, cops in a special unit who are charged with getting drugs and guns off the street of Upper Manhattan, the streets that I used to live on and work in. And uh, they do it too well. And at one point they make the biggest heroin bust in the history of New York and keep half the dope and half the money for themselves. And then we get into some real moral choices about what life looks like after that. It's also a book about kind of what's going on in our country now, about the, uh, the relationship between police and inner city communities, about the shootings of unarmed uh, young black men uh, the book starts, it's a three-page list of 178 names. Uh, and those names are police officers, men and women, who were killed uh, just during the time I was typing the book, a little under two years. Uh, I have a, a great feeling for police officers. There, there's great problems with policing in this country right now. We're doing things at the moment to make it worse instead of better. I could talk about that if you'd like. Uh, but I got to know cops, you know. We often think of the police, you know, because of pop culture like me and because of television and movies, we tend to think that the, the basic dynamic is between cop and criminal. Yeah, because that's what we see. That's, that's the story, you know, in Law and Order and in all the movies, and that's true. But the real dynamic, and we often forget this, is between cop and victim. And think it through a little bit. When a cop arrives on the scene, he or she rarely sees the perpetrator. It does happen, but that's the minority of cases. The cop always sees the victim. It's the cop that goes to the emergency room. It's the cop that goes to the morgue. It's the cop that goes and has to ring that doorbell to tell a family their loved one is not coming back. And when you talk to cops, and I talk to many you know, in depth, and I went out on the street with them. You know, I went out, you know, with plainclothes units late at night uh, in the inner cities. Uh, when you really get beyond that sort of famous cop 
veneer, you know, that tough cynical shell, which is a psychological defense mechanism, very necessary one. Uh, one thing that surprised me, and I'm a little embarrassed that it surprised me, was how much they care about those victims. How much they care about doing their jobs. You know, it's, it's always dangerous to generalize. And we can talk about that too. But, you know, I, I met cops who, Gene and I sat down a couple of times talking to veteran cops who probably hadn't talked about this stuff in years. And I would say to them, I'm not so interested in what you did. I'm interested in how you felt and what you thought. Because I think my job as a novelist is to take the reader into a world that he or she couldn't go into and then let them see that through those people's eyes. And so to do that, I need to get into their heads. I need to know what's going on in their hearts and their minds. And, and that's really my job. That, that's what I do for a living. And so we would talk to cops on that level. And, you know, there were times that, that we were crying. Sometimes from laughter, because these are some of the funniest people in the world and some of the great storytellers, and they told howlingly funny stories, many of which are in the novel. Uh, but they also, at times, went back to cases that they still carry with them. They still carry with them. And the tears came, you know, which was kind of a surprise. So this is a book about a cop, it's seen entirely through his point of view, a guy named Denny Malone, rock star cop, charismatic, magnetic guy who sets out to do good, starts doing some wrong things, starts taking some shortcuts in order to do that, and then really falls into temptation. And then he's faced with some impossible choices about who to stay loyal to and who to betray. So that, that's the book. And uh, I know I'm just, you know, always aware of the clock. So what I'd like to do now, if it's acceptable to you guys, is to just open up the floor for questions. Now I warn you, if there are no questions, I will keep talking. <laughs> so you have a rooting interest <laughs> in asking some questions. If you don't, I'll just start telling stories and it will just go on and on. So do we have any questions or comments you'd like to talk about cops or the book or writing or drug policy or, or anything? I'm, I'm happy to talk about those things. I see it. Down, yes, ma'am. And then down here. Yes. Yes, ma'am. The question was, is there anything on TV that accurately portrays police life? Uh, yes, there's a show called The First 48. Uh, it's a reality show and it follows homicide detectives. The, the, so the saying is, and I think it's pretty accurate, that after 48 hours after a murder, if you don't have a lead within 48 hours, you're probably done. Hi. Took me a minute. Of course. Much love. Uh, that, that's a terrific one. Uh, if you go back to an older show called NYPD Blue, that was pretty accurate in, in my experience. There was a question down. Yes, ma'am. Police and attitudes about the NRA. It's very divided. It depends on where you are in the country and who you're talking to. So if you tend to be in rural areas, police tend to be more positive toward the NRA. If, you, if you're in northeastern cities or a place like Chicago, police are much more in favor of gun control. Now, gun control folks like to say the following. Well, Chicago has the strictest gun control laws in the country and it also has the highest murder rate. Well, they don't make the guns in Chicago. The guns come up from states that have loose gun laws, from gun fairs and gun shows and gun dealers that, are, that use the loose laws. And they come up something called the Iron Pipeline, uh, a nickname for Route 95. Uh, and then they are disseminated to gangs and, and in the cities. So cops in, the, in, in you know, urban areas um, are more interested in getting guns off the street than anybody think it through. They see the victims. I had a, a, a cop buddy call me the other day just to blow off steam. 
which they sometimes do. And he said, I'm so sick of seeing people with their toes up, you know, and gunshot wounds. And I don't know if you've ever seen a gunshot wound. I have. Um, you, you don't want to. It's not going to improve your life. It's a horrible thing. And so uh, I, those cops really want guns off the street. And of course, it's those guns that kill cops. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The question was, did I talk to minority cops and did I find different attitudes between minority cops and, and let's just shorthand it, white cops? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes and yes. Uh, I talked to a lot of minority cops. You know, now, for instance, NYPD uh, is 50 percent white and 50 percent other minorities. Uh, so there are a lot of black cops out there. The difference, Barbara, was a generational difference. Uh, when you talk to older black cops, they're blue. They're blue first and black second. When you talk to younger black cops, they tend to have a more nuanced attitude toward that. Uh, and they, they tend to be more aware of some of the problems. The, what bothers me right now about this whole discussion, if I may, can I preach for a second? is it lacks, it lacks nuance. We're taking sides. There are no sides in reality. The, the, the people who suffer most from violent crime are people in poor communities, tend to be minorities. They, should, they and the police should be natural allies. But, thank you. But we sh I, I wish we'd drop the right of it and the left of it, the Republican of it and the Democrat of it and look at what works. And could we please look at science? The research of this is telling us a lot. Research shows without question, I'm sorry, it's very clear that white people tend to be more afraid of black people than they are of others, other whites. S Studies at UCLA, North Carolina, elsewhere show us this. It also shows us that white, for instance, cops tend to overestimate the age of young black males. So, so what? Well, the so what of that is that they also therefore tend to overestimate the threat potential. So if you look at 11 year old African American kid with a squirt gun and you think he's 14, you have a different reaction to that, and a tragedy ensues. That's the bad news. The good news is recent testing also shows us that you can train yourself out of those unconscious biases. We have the technology now. So I wish we just drop all of just the sound bites and the headlines, do something pragmatic, look at what works. What works is, more careful recruiting, some people should not be cops because they are either they're overt racists or they have, it's the opposite of what you think. It's not that their egos are too big, it's that their egos are too small. They, their egos are brittle and therefore when they're challenged, they respond in an extreme fashion. They shouldn't be cops and cops will tell you they shouldn't be cops. I'm sorry, I get very worked up about this because I've been dealing with it for a long time now. So we have, we know what the answers are and, and we also know that the answer lies in community policing. I got a police chief call me up a few months ago, incredulous. And he said, they just, they, the federal government, just cut my community police funding in half, it gets worse, and sent me a tank. I pause for effect. A, ta a, ta a tank. Now, what are you going to do with a tank? I'm going to get to you, sir. I see it. Thank you. And what is the community going to think when they see a tank coming in? Yes, sir, in the back, in the green. There's a microphone headed your way. Thank you. So what about uh, black cops policing in black communities? Um, uh, in, in a little 
put it, putting more black cops in uh, black communities and maybe partnering, partnering them up with uh, white cops? Well, it's a good idea. And we should be doing more of it. And, and NYPD, in fact, is moving in that direction by recruiting, hiring more minority cops. They do. They do. But here, and I will come to, I'll make this very brief. The, the other half of the problem, though, is the way that we police. It's a technical issue. We tend to police now by response. We used to police by patrol. Okay? When we police by patrol, the cop knew that kid. The kid knew that cop. The cops knew not just the criminals in a community who are a very tiny minority. In most precincts in New York, they've identified 75 to 80 individuals who caused 85% of the crime in that precinct. So they know they are. So when the cop was on the corner, when the cop was on the street, when we were doing community policing, those tensions, you know, dropped. But now cops come in on response. So what happens? They're only called in when something is bad. And they're responding to people that they don't know, who don't know them. The tension level rises, the threat level rises. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Okay. And that's the important thing. Um, I'd like to know your attitude about stop and frisk because I come from Chicago and a lot of policemen look for early retirement because they put their lives on the line. Correct. And they have families. Right. I mean, we, we had a doorman at our Mm -hmm. And so, what do you think of that? I think that stop and frisk is not as effective as it's been said to be, frankly. I don't think that the juice is worth the squeeze. Do you know what I mean by that? That, that I, I, I understand the impulse behind stop and frisk. I just sort of talked about it. You know the people in your community who are going to cause the problems. There's a real temptation, okay, to take a, a sort of a preemptive raid, right, and, and try to get that person off the street early. That's the juice. But the squeeze is that you cause, that, that you stop, when stop and frisk gets out of hand, when it becomes just too easy and generalized a tool, you are stopping and frisking a lot of innocent people. When you do that, you, you raise the level of hostility in that community. And then overall, it has a negative effect because the people that you want talking to you will no longer talk to you. Just one more, ma'am, and then I need to move on. Not really. They say, to, look, if, if, you look at, if you look at violent crime, really, what you're looking at is the, the, the percentage of population of 18 to 25 year old males. If you look at those lines, violent crime rates, that demographic, they go like that. They almost entirely parallel each other. So when we look at stop and frisk, broken windows theory, all these various law enforcement theories, do they work? Sure, to a certain extent. But really, that's what you're looking at. Uh, a lot of questions. Somebody else pick somebody. I'm getting. Would you speak about broken window theory just for a moment? If you'd like. Boy, we're turning this into a highly technical discussion tonight. Broke, do you know what broken windows theory is? No. Broken windows theory says the following it started with an anthropological study that said when you have an abandoned building and someone comes by and they throw a rock into one of the windows and you don't fix the window, other people will come by and throw rocks through the other windows, and then you have a decrepit building, and then the next building falls. It's sort of a domino theory. So uh, in New York, uh, several very smart police officers took broken windows anthropological theory and made a criminal analogy. And what it basically said was, if you let that kid 
jump the subway style without paying to get into the subway, that is very likely the same kid who mugs the elderly lady in the subway. So broken windows theory said you stop it here. So when NYPD was frankly in a pretty loose, pretty bad condition in the late 70s, they were ignoring all those little crimes, the misdemeanors. And broken windows theory said no, if you attack the misdemeanors, there will be this effect on the other end because you are putting people in jail for littering, you know, <laughs> jumping subway styles, doing graffiti, breaking windows that would otherwise cause crime. That's broken windows theory in a nutshell. It has its limits. And, and the, the, yes sir, the limits are the drug tsunami wipes out broken windows theory. Yeah, that's where I'm going. A few thoughts on our war on drugs? I am pretty well known for my opinion on that, sir. Um, I have great respect for DEA officers, cops, border patrol, all of those people who are fighting the war on drugs, but they're fighting the wrong war. Uh, we've been fighting the war on drugs for 50 years, officially, but really closer to 100 when you look at various statutes. After 50 years and over a trillion dollars, TR, Carl Sagan numbers, a trillion dollars of the war on drugs, what's the result? Drugs are cheaper, more powerful, more available than ever. If that's winning, I would hate to see losing. It does not work. If you had a friend who was banging his head against the wall for 50 years and then complained to you about a headache, what's the first thing you'd tell that friend? Stop banging your head against the wall. It doesn't work. Last year, 2016 in the United States, 62,000 people died just from opioid overdoses. That's more than in car accidents, 62,000. What we're doing doesn't work. We spend something like $88 billion a year. I'm sorry, I get into a rant. I apologize, I'm gonna stop. $88 billion a year in trying to interdict drugs, in arresting people, putting them through our court system, and keeping them in prison. 2.2 million Americans in prison now, the largest prison population in the history of our planet. It's, it's a machine that requires the constant fueling, and the fueling is mostly young minority men. So, if, if, if I were the czar, not a bad idea. I would legalize or decriminalize all drugs yesterday. Doesn't do any good just to do marijuana because the, it's balloon theory. We're very technical criminology tonight. The, the pressure in the balloon goes somewhere else as it's gone to heroin. We need to treat this as the social health problem it is, not a law enforcement problem, and God help us, not a military problem. End of speech. Sir, if you pick people out, thank you. Yes, so, right here. What's well, mine? Okay, uh, so Don, uh, to reinforce what you told the person over there, in New York back in the 1980s, what they did, in one of their concepts was they took certain precincts and they flooded, as you probably sure. know. They flooded that precinct and said, okay, do a stop and frisk. So what happened was the crime moved over to the next precinct. Right. Along with that is Give me, give us your, your analysis. What has, one, to begin with, you talked about the reactionary way that cops police. That goes back to 1950s, 60s, not only the 90s. What has community policing done for American policing, in your opinion? In my opinion? Yeah. Well, we've abandoned it to a great extent. Well, we have, sir. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. We're, still it. We're not funding it as much as we should be funding it. We are. I agree with that. But in big cities, I'll take Chicago. Right. That they blame the doing it. But what is the difference between doing it and not doing it? 
Well, the difference between doing it and not doing it, in my opinion, is a matter of time and funding and literally the way we patrol. Now, Chicago is, is in a very tough situation police-wise. So you saw the headlines yesterday and, and you've seen the development. In neighborhoods, though, in New York, I'm much more experienced about New York than I am in Chicago, okay? Where we've really done community policing, we have seen crime go down. I also believe in community policing in regards to terrorism. I know a police officer, a woman, whose entire job it is, hang out with Muslim women. She's not undercover. They know she's a cop. Her entire job is to build relationships. And that's what we really need to be doing, whether it's the anti-terrorism front in cities, you know, for young men who are being radicalized, or in the inner city. The other real issue, though, with community policing, again, I, I know I sound like a broken record, is to end the war on drugs, because that's really where the militarization of police, I think, comes in. And I think that needs to be really toned down. Did, did I answer the question you asked me, though, sir? Not really. To an extent, yeah. If I had all the answers. OK, thank you. Um, wanted to go back. You, you talked about your experiences as a PI that helped you write The Force. How did you research a book like Power of the Dog and the Cartel? I mean, when I read both of those books, it was like, wow, this guy was like, was he there? <laughs> No. Um, I have a very specific way I like to research books. I, I, start, I always start with history because I believe in chronology. You know, I believe without, you know, you have D, but if you don't know C, B, and A, you're nowhere. So with dog and, and cartel, I just read Mexican and Latin American history until I had a, a sense of that. Once I've done the history, I go to journalism and I start reading the best journalism and nonfiction books out there. Once I've done that, I think I know enough that I can select documents, court records, trial transcripts, police reports, FBI reports, in the, in the case of dog redacted CIA reports. Once I, I feel that I have enough knowledge that I can go out and talk to people without wasting their time, then I go out and talk to people. You go to prisons, I go to lawyers, I go to ex-cons, I go to, yeah, drug people, to cops, DEA, Border Patrol, all of that. And talk to them. Find out about their lives, find out what's on their minds, find all that out. That's the research process. To research and write dog was about six years. Yeah, cartel about the same uh, we did a nonfiction book about Vietnam. My friend Pete Maslowski, very eminent military historian. Uh, and that was, what, a 10-year project. I mean, you're doing other things. But there's no substitute for time, is there? What's the cost of community policing uh, in an area versus the practices that are employed today? It's more expensive. And is it worth it? Yes. Can't that be proved? Well, you know, at what point do you end the study? At what point, you know, do you say, okay, this is over, we've done this many years of this and that. Uh, I think it can be proved. You should do that in Chicago. Well, Chicago has a lot of problems, and I don't want to dump on Chicago, and I don't want to dump on the Chicago PD, and, and I want to echo what this lady says. When I go off to work, the, the biggest thing my wife has to worry about is I might be in a bad mood when I come home. <laughs> but she knows I'm coming home. Right? Cop spouses don't know that. You know? So I, I wrote a book about a, you know, a dirty cop. That's what the novel's about. That's the story. But I, I don't want to stand up here and, you know, and be slamming on cops and, and all of that. It's just not what I think and that's not the way I feel. But what I'm saying is that I think we need to make some adjustments and some serious adjustments in the way that we ask those guys to do their jobs. And right now, we are asking cops to be everything to everybody. We're asking them to be mental health counselors. We're asking them to be psychiatrists. We're asking them to be EMTs now. 
you know, with drug overdoses. I, I think we ask way too much of our police forces. And then again, we're surprised when bad things happen. Well, a number of police chiefs I know are. And look, some aren't. I mean, this is, this is controversial. There are some police chiefs who said, no, this is the way we do it, and this is, you know. And also, I think that, that generalizations are dangerous, and I know I've given some here tonight. I think you have to look at particular communities, particular cities, and within those cities, as this gentleman said, you, you have to look at certain precincts at certain times, because things change. You know, when I started writing this book. In New York, guys were out on the street selling dope. Now they're not because of texting. Right? So at one point in writing this book, you had a certain kind of crime problem and you had a certain way of addressing it. Now most of those drug sales have moved indoors because why risk standing out there to get busted when you can go inside and you text your dealer and he or she texts you back and all this. So policing is always needing to evolve and adapt to new situations. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, so I have a, a friend that does a lot of traveling and sales and uh, he has a permit. He never goes out on the road without his gun. I just want to know your feeling if it makes people feel safer or or how is it affecting? Well, apparently carrying a gun does make some people feel safer. I, I have nothing against the person who's very well trained and not mentally ill. No, I didn't mean that to be a joke. If, if they want a, a, you know, a personal weapon, I don't have a problem with that. I do not see any reason on earth why anyone who's not with the police or the military needs an AR-15, you know? Assault rifles, I, I don't get it. I don't buy the NRA argument with that. I don't buy that that's covered by the Second Amendment, any of that. I don't buy the argument, you know, that in Aurora, if people in a darkened movie theater, you know, who are terrified and adrenaline is screeching, you know, had guns, they, they would have accurately shot back. Uh, I've taken some of the police training for guns. I know how hard it is to fire a pistol accurately, and I know how hard it is when your adrenaline is shrieking. You know, um, it's very, very difficult. So I, I don't buy that whole armed populace makes us safer argument. Given the subject matter in your books and your background as yeah. a, a private investigator, did you ever have thoughts of becoming a police officer? No, I'm five foot six and 130 pounds. <laughs> and so not only did I not have thoughts of becoming a police officer, the police department had no thoughts of my <laughs> becoming a police officer. No, listen, this is the job I've always wanted. I'm happy to have it. I'll settle at that. Thank you, sir. I, I'm just, I'm a, this gentleman, the guys are handing out the microphones. Yes, sir. Uh, the only reason I can see to have a gun is the only purpose of it is to kill. Now, why is it that Washington politicians have not taken on the NRA? I never heard. I did not see. Oh, I, I know. Barbara, <laughs> which. <laughs> Do you need the microphone? Um, which is supported by 85% of the people of the country. I think if we took a poll here, we'd probably get the same. Background check before you get a gun, so you avoid the problem you mentioned. Is it someone who's mentally unbalanced, has a bad history of domestic violent abuse, etc.? That couldn't get passed after Sandy Hook, and little babies were murdered. And I get the chills. And, and when NBC talk about just it. gave a platform to a man who said that that was a farce wow. and that those children were actors. In the most disgraceful public act since the last disgraceful public so act. So I'll finish with this. I'll finish with this. 
The reason you can't get the vote is because they're afraid of the NRA. The people who get elected with the support of the NRA are afraid, even in a circumstance where it's 85% or safety locks to protect your gun that's at home from a little child grabbing it. So it's fear of not being elected. And let me tell you, I know how that feels. <laughs> But for me, I just always did what I thought was right, and thank God it worked for many years. So, but I really do appreciate your nuanced views on, on carrying a gun, because I think if someone does feel comfortable with it, and they want it to protect themselves, and they're, they're a good person, plus they're trained, for me, that's not an issue. Right. The issue is all these other weapons that are out there. Listen, we live out in the country. People have guns. We have, yeah. But you know, the NRA portrays itself as a grassroots organization where, you know, supported by every man, 76%, I think, of their contributions come from dot, 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 gun manufacturers. Yes, the voice of the desert. <laughs> no, just the, <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask you a, a simple question. I know that there's no simple Thank answer God. to it. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> Some beat, man. These guys are dragging me out. Yeah. I, I want to know who you think are the bad guys in this war on drugs. And I don't mean, and I understand that, you know, if, if we're creating a demand for, for drugs, that we're all the bad guys. Yep. But, but if we could go after somebody if, who are the generals in the war on crime and the war on, on drugs, would you go after people in the pharmaceutical companies? Would you go after people who were coming up with these sophisticated encryptions past the, the Silk Road? I mean, would you go after a certain cartel? Who would you like to, to get your hands on? That was the simple question? <laughs> Does anyone have a complicated? Well, let's, it, that, that question is so, has so many layers, but let, let me give it a shot, aware that time is going by here. First of all, I wouldn't. I, I, I would want to stop fighting the war on drugs on that level. Who are the bad guys? Look, the, the drug cartel leaders are bad people. In my opinion, there's not enough bad things that could happen to them to make me happy. All right, I'm very happy Mr. Guzman and the rest are in jail. Hope they stay there the rest of their lives. They deserve it. Let them rot. I don't care. Uh, having said that, the arrest of, for instance, Guzman had, did not stop, slow, or pause the, the flow of drugs because by the time we got him, he was already irrelevant. Replacement was in, next man up, system moves on. So it, it doesn't... It doesn't do any good. Are they terrible people? You bet. You bet. But um, I also believe in God. And I believe at the end of the day, you know, justice will be served at one point or another. But as long as we are trying to affect the war on drugs on the supply side, we'll never win. It has to be on the demand side. And when we talk about the so-called Mexican drug problem, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's not the Mexican drug problem, it is the American drug problem. You know, we send $62 billion a year down there to murderers and rapists and people who enslave other people, $62 billion a year. And when I talk to particularly young people about this, you know, and I say to them, I say, I agree the laws should change here, but until they do, it's immoral to use recreational drugs. It is, because that money that you take out of your pocket to pay for that little party bit of cocaine goes right into the hands of murderers. I'm always shocked, you know, from my, my you know, friends to the left, you know, the, the sort of Occupy people, and I have a lot of friends there, who will go and they'll boycott, you know, and picket a grocery store over free trade coffee. Then they'll go home and they'll smoke dope brought to them by people who torture children. 
And I say to them, how do you justify that? And I always get this, I always get the same answer. I don't know if you do. I always get the same answer. I could predict it. They say, well, I only smoke grass grown by my cousin Jim in a window box. <laughs> and I say, I want to see your cousin Jim's window. Because <laughs> it must be really big. So... I feel the bad guys are the bad guys. Those are bad guys. Big pharmaceutical, look, it's easy to throw stones at them, and, and they deserve some of those stones, absolutely. But in some ways, thank God for drugs. Thank God for opioids. People are in terrible pain, and it relieves that. It's not drugs that are inherently the problem. If I get a, you know, a sinus infection, I go to the drug store, it says it right there, and I buy drugs, and then I don't die from that, as we used to. My wife injured her knee a couple of years ago rather severely. Thank God they had an opioid, they had morphine to give her. It's the abuse of that drug, and what we have to, and while I'm, you know, giving a sermon, if you'd like to be saved afterwards, there's a... <laughs> We do a thing, it's a bonus. <laughs> we often point our finger at Mexico and other countries, and we talk about corruption there, don't we? We've gotten very good at it lately from Washington. If I were on the other side of that border looking north, as I have been, I'd ask this question about corruption. I'd say to the United States, what is the national corruption of your soul and public character that makes you the largest consumer of drugs in the world at a rate five times your population? Now, opioids are always a response to pain. Always, 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 that's what opioids do. They soothe pain. Often it starts as physical pain and then it becomes an addiction, but there are other kinds of pain. There are, Emotional pain, psychological pain, social pain, economic pain, and until we look at the source of the pain in this country, we will never solve the drug problem. End of sermon. Say amen, somebody. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm their creature. They're handing mics out to people. Um, you're obviously very passionate about the subjects that you write, whether it's the drug cartel mm -hmm. or the police force, but you've written a wide variety of books. Mm -hmm. um, I just happened to finish reading California Fire and Life, right. and, which is so different yeah. from, from this. And I'm wondering what what is your impetus for writing any of these books? Dark you know? books. <laughs> no, well, that was an interesting one, but you have you you seem to have a lot of different interests. And, well, yeah. I, look, what the, the, was the impetus for that one? I'm curious. For, for Cal Fire and Life. Yeah, I did, when I was an investigator and a trial consultant, I did a lot of work for insurance companies who didn't want to pay people to burn their houses and businesses down. And I agreed with them. So I was the guy who worked with the fire investigators and helped translate that to lawyers to talk to people, to talk to juries about it. So in order to do that, I had to learn, you know, a lot about fire science. So that was the impetus for that book. Thank you for asking. The problem with life, and you probably all know this, is not that there's too little to do, there's too much. I didn't think that was a problem when I was 23. <laughs> now I kind of think it's a problem, and there's so many books I'd like to write. John, thank Matt. you so much. Oh, Everyone, thank you. Thank <laughs> you so much for coming. Thank you.